Indian versus uh, the you know other countries' energy market. So now let's get started with the blockchain. So, so what is uh, um, you know what is blockchain? So you can see that uh, uh, on, on the on the screen on the slide itself, um, it reads that blockchain is a system of recording information in a way that it that makes it difficult or impossible to hack, change, or cheat. So it's a recording. It's a system of recording information, which you cannot uh, you know hack or cheat or change. And the second point says it's essentially a digital ledger of transactions that is duplicated and distributed across the entire network of computer systems on the blockchain. So on the screen, on the left hand side, you can see a physical ledger and on the right hand side, you can see a digital ledger. But now what are we going to talk about? You know, we are, you know, if you look at the definition, it says it's a digital ledger of transactions that is duplicated and distributed across the entire network of systems, which means when on the right hand side, when I say it is a digital record, it's a digital ledger, then what am I talking about? Now I'm talking about a different type of ledger, which is duplicated. But whereas when you look at it, you know, your bank will have that software, you know, if, if, if the, you know, maybe if your accountant is maintaining that physical ledger, you will have it's a single ledger and you will have the act, you will have it uh, in his possession. But now I'm talking about another type of digital ledger, which is duplicated, which is distributed across the entire network. And it's quite difficult to change, hack or cheat. So one disclaimer at the beginning of this, you know, understanding blockchain is blockchain is very difficult to understand. You know, if you want to try to understand in a comprehensive manner, it's a bit difficult, despite how many times you read or listen about it, you know, from how many people you do it. Uh, but let's let's let me give it a try and see you know uh, whether I can demystify at least some of the um, some of the uh, aspects of blockchain for you. Um, and another thing is, I'm only going to explain the concept. I'm not going to explain the implementation or underlying framework details. So how would we uh, you know understand blockchain? I would say blockchain is in is currently in its early stages. Um, it's like the internet of 1990s and it could be as big as the internet. And I also would like to highlight that blockchain is definitely not a use case of the internet, like email, e-commerce or social networking. Blockchain is as fundamental and, and it is parallel to the internet. And, uh, you know, as I said, you know, it, it sounds incredibly simple and I'm sure by listening to different people last few days, uh, you would have already realized it that uh, every time you try to understand it from the concept of a use case, you would un you would feel the difficulty and complexity of the you know, concept of blockchain. And I have no hesitation in saying that blockchain has got the potential to change our lives in the next 20 years, the same way how internet has changed in the last 20 years. And blockchain removed, you know, when we are saying that blockchain is nothing but a ledger, which is an open distributed, right? We can also go ahead and say that blockchain can remove all the clerical errors. You know, it will it will remove the concept of single source of failure. And finally, the most important thing to know is blockchain is not spelled B I T C O I N. Bitcoin is different. Blockchain is different. They are related. So generally, when I you know when I ask about Bitcoin to some of my colleagues in the technology domain, and all the time I hear you know colleagues say that blockchain is the technology behind the, Bitcoin or blockchain is the technology behind cryptocurrency or blockchain is technology behind um, either. It is true, but it's like defining internet as the technology behind email, which is also true, but the explanation doesn't begin to describe the internet anywhere close, isn't it? I'm sure you would agree with me. You know, you can't simply uh, try to define internet by saying that it's the technology behind email. So, if you say that blockchain is technology behind Bitcoin, you are doing the same mistake, uh, you know, by saying internet as the technology behind email. You can do lots of things with internet, right? So, but I'm sure, you know, you would have a decent understanding of Bitcoin as well. Like uh, the name itself would, uh, when you use, look at the word coin, you know, the name itself would say that uh, it's a digital currency with an equivalent dollar value, right? You know, you can, you can sell it, you can buy it, or you can use it to buy stuff. The moment you tell people that there is no bank involved, there's no issuing authority, there's no government, no gold backing, people will get petrified. 
I'm sure you would have also have the same experience. You know, when I say that Bitcoin, you know, there's no bank, there's no issuing authority, no government, you know, no gold backing, then, you know, that's the same feeling that you and I would get. But now let's try to understand blockchain and Bitcoin beyond these small definitions. So actually they are different. There are different ways of, you know, thinking about blockchain as well. One way of thinking every time I think about blockchain, I think of it as a one big ledger in the cloud. Let me repeat it. Every time I think about blockchain, I always look at it as one big ledger in the cloud. So, you know, imagine everything we own today, be it your money, your assets, you know, they're all nothing but entries in the ledger. So what I will do next a few slides, I will take one of the most common examples or usages of blockchain and try to understand a little more. So look at this. Tell me what is the most common trusted authority in the financial world? You would agree with me when I say it's the bank. I know that, you know, these days uh, things are not as good uh, with all the banks, but still, you know, in the, the given setup, in the current world, you know, we cannot think anything other than the bank as the most common trusted authority in the financial world. And I would say that the bank is not in the money lending or borrowing business. I would always say, in my opinion, bank is in the trust business. So we blindly trust bank to keep our money safe, to keep our belongings safe, to keep our goals safe, right? But any bank, which is a single point of trust, there is a possibility that it can be compromised. So look at this slide. Here, you are trying to send, say, $100 from India to your friend in USA. So what is this transaction is all about? It's a ledger, right? It's a ledger entry, which happens in your ledger at the bank. Again, another ledger entry, which happens in your friend's ledger in his bank, and the money gets transferred. I hope you're with me. However, the problem is between your ledger and your friend's ledger, when I say your ledger and your friend's ledger, the ledger, your ledger maintained by the bank and your friend's ledger maintained by the bank. So the problem is between your ledger and your friend's ledger, there are a bunch of other ledgers, such as the money transferring institutions, other banks, regulators, auditors, insurance companies, and each of these ledgers can be reconciled and you know, they can be, uh, each of these ledgers has to be reconciled and they have to be, they have to be, uh, uh, there should be a correlation between all of them and remember, you will send $100 and your friend will get only $98 or $99. Now I told you that, you know, I have a team of 140 people and we don't sell our software to anyone. We work for our group companies. Our software is used by our group companies, which means we have to get our money from, you know, in order to run the operations here, I need to get money from my retailing businesses. So when I get the money, I get the forex. I get the forex money and then I, I get it in New Zealand dollars because of various government norms and I have to change it to Indian currency. And every time, every time during the negotiations with the bank, even a one paisa difference for the kind of amount that I'm bringing every month for a one paisa difference, I would end up gaining or losing 10 to 15,000. So imagine what kind of business are we talking about? So you send $100 and your friend is getting $99. And another point worth noting is that your friend will get the money only after three or four days. So imagine what happens when so many of these ledgers, uh, you know, when there are so many ledgers involved in case of an incorrect transaction, what happens? You know, your friend says he sent $1,000, $100 and the bank says uh, your friend said sent only $10. So it creates a lot of friction, a lot of frustration because a lot of ledgers are involved in the whole process. Everything has to be reconciled, right? And it takes a lot of time and adds additional cost to the operations of various entities involved in the process. Right. So what if, what if I say that, you know, there are no intermediaries, intermediaries. What if you send hundred dollars, your friend gets hundred dollars. What if you send money now and your friend gets it immediately? What if you replace that single trusted authority with a distributed trust? That's when you will have blockchain technology. And, you know, so imagine it's like a blockchain is giving you one universal ledger in cloud, one single ledger in cloud, as I mentioned earlier. And what if all the entities or participants that I mentioned earlier, such as, you know, my bank, your bank, your friend's bank, the money transferring institutions, other banks, regulators, you know, all other part, all other people that I mentioned, what if they're all participants in the ledger? 
or if I use a slightly different language in technical words, we call them as nodes in that ledger. And what if every time an entry had to happen, every single one of those parts spent would authenticate it and say, this is right, this is right, this is right, or this is not right. Wonderful, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a single universal ledger, which is in cloud, which is access, accessible to all these entities. So no one needed to maintain their duplicate technology. They, they don't need to maintain their own frameworks. They don't to, need to maintain their own, uh, you know, um, uh, proprietary uh, IT frameworks to be able to manage their day-to-day -day operations. So the concept of the single universal ledger is the heart of the blockchain. That's the key thing that you have to imprint in your mind. So the concept of the single universal ledger is the heart of the blockchain and whenever a transaction happens a new block gets added to an existing chain of transactions protected by everyone and we use the best cryptographic algorithms to protect the blockchain therefore it is very difficult to hack and the other important thing is every block added is immutably linked to the last block and if a hacker wants to change one block they have to they have to change all the blocks are not possible. The algorithms are driven by consensus and immutability. I'll explain it in detail. Uh, someone need to mute themselves, please. And because it is a chain, the traceability is so easy. And again, there is something called smart contracts, which I will come a little later. So there's something called smart contracts. It's basically a logic built into blocks, uh, you know, which would trigger an event in case of any, you know, configured activity. I will explain that with an example, but that those smart contracts also make things, you know, a lot interesting and a lot secure. And finally, no one wants the chain. But you may ask when no one maintains it. It's not one bank, it's not, you know, one split authority, it's multiple code entities. Like, you know, you can previously you saw three, you know, different banks, you know, imagine them as an approved nodes, and then they all can start accessing this single universal ledger, which is available in the cloud. So to maintain this chain or a copy of ledger, you require a lot of resources. You require a lot of compute power. You require electricity. You require air conditioning. You require backup power, time, money. This is why when, you know, no one knows this guy, Satoshi Nakamoto, you know, who invented uh, this Bitcoin, what he did was he did a very brilliant thing. He created he created what someone need to unmute, uh, mute themselves, please. Um, hearing the echo, um, someone's name starting with uh, Sudha. Yeah, can, you, can you please uh, mute yourself? Sudhan Shu, sorry, Sudhan Shu. Sudan Shu Ranjan. Can I mute him? Can you also hear the sound or is it just me? Yes, yes, everybody is hearing. I think coordinator can mute the guy. Yes, someone need to mute them. Maybe Call it an info. Yeah, thanks. So he did a very brilliant thing. He created a currency along with it. And that currency is the incentive for all the people who are maintaining the chain. Since the currency is called Bitcoin, we call it as Bitcoin blockchain. And, and the entities who manage it is called the, uh, you know, minor $10 at the inception of the system. Think of E. A, B, C, D. Think of A, B, C, D as different nodes, right? A has got ten dollars at the inception of the, you know, the network is formed, and A sent ten dollars, five dollars to B. So you can see that uh, we have a record which says that we have a block which says that A has got ten dollars. Now A sent five dollars to B. Now you've got another block, and these two are interlinked, and then B sent, uh, you know, again three dollars out of the five dollars that he has got. He sent three dollars. So B sent. Three dollars to D and D sent one dollar to C. So now, as you can see that now we have got one, um, you know, we have got one. We got a. This is called an open ledger, basically. So it's essentially a chain of transactions. So we got one open ledger, which is a chain of transactions which are open and public. 
So now everyone can see the ledger and everyone can see where the money is going and how many how much money equity. Don't think those no people think them as the approved financial institutions such as a bank, such as RBI, you know, such as the insurance company, right, or such as a forex company. So each of them would know uh, because they all have got the access to this ledger. They all know, you know, how the transactions are happening, whether it is a valid transaction, invalid transaction, uh, you know, so on and so forth. So if you just go one step ahead, I told you that, you know, you cannot have a centralized ledger that's against to the concept of blockchain. You have to get rid of the centralized ledger, the centralized ledger. Therefore, it should be a distributed ledger, right? So now D can have a copy of the ledger. A can have a copy of the ledger. You know, there will be an approval process. So, you know, you can, uh, if you're talking about banking system, there'll be a common process where you go, you know, you apply, you, you know, try to be a different node, right? Every bank would be a node, but you know, these guys A and D, because they're holding a copy of the ledger, they are, they are called specialized nerd, uh, nodes who are having a copy of the ledger. In other words, they are called the miners. I'll explain what they do. So now, but now when you look at it, you've got two copies of the same ledger. Now you ended up creating another problem. Now you've got various copies of the same record. So how do you maintain that they are synchronous? In other words, how do you maintain the data integrity? So let me explain how it happens. So if you look at uh, this, this example where you know, he has got ten dollars, he sent ten all ten dollars to B, right? And and then again B sent uh, you know five dollars to C. Now let's say that uh, B has got five dollars with him, right? And he wanted to send it to D. So what happens now? What are the steps that would happen for it? Uh, you know, for you know when B wants to move five dollars to D, that is called an invalidated transaction, which means it's not a validated one yet. For it to get into the ledger, we need to understand the concept of miners. Miners are, as I mentioned, they are the special nodes which will hold a copy of the ledger. And in this diagram, you can see A and C are the you know, nodes with copy of the ledger, whom we call as miners. So now the miners, they are going to compete among themselves to validate the transaction and put it into the ledger. The first miner who will do that will get a financial reward. So now, before I explain that process, have a look at this one. And I've come across it a few weeks ago. And this, uh, you know, this image would tell you how much time it takes for a hacker to crack your password. I'm talking about your Gmail password. I'm, I'm talking about your bank password. I'm talking about any other passwords that you use on internet. Look at the, look at the various combinations. If you use just the numbers only, you know, see how easy it is to, you know, for a hacker to crack it. Use just lower cases. And if you use combination, somebody is getting reduced. If you use upper and lower here, and again lower uh, and numbers here, and then you got along with them, you got symbols as well. And again, if you see, if you increase the number of characters, because which we don't want, uh, you know, we generally don't want it to keep it simple. We wanted to use our birthdays, we wanted to use, you know, uh, maybe some family member names and all that. But Talking about a hacker, I'm talking about an algorithm which runs behind the scenes, which continuously runs against your account to hack it, to unlock it, to boost, you know, to brute force it. But if you see this diagram, the more numbers that you put, then the more difficulty. And you know, if you increase number, if you increase the number of characters, and if you increase the combination, then you can see it will take 15 billion years, one trillion years, 93 trillion years. Okay, so keep this in mind. Now let's go back to our previous uh, example. So now what happened? B wanted to, right? B wanted to send, uh, you know, that money five dollars to D, right? So let's understand what does it means for C and A to win the competition because we are talking about miners, right? So the miner needs to do three things. He needs to validate the transaction. He needs to link the block with the old block. And you need to publish the results so that all other nodes in the system would know that uh, someone has already validated it. Okay, so now if you look at this, this is how the hash would look like. You know, this is the hash. So what happens is every time you add a block, you would use an algorithm called SHA 256 algorithm and you double hash it and you look at the count. You know, you, that's the reason why I showed you the previous slide. 
this is the kind of hash with which a block gets initiated so when the block gets initiated here this guy this information will get notified to all other nodes in the system now we have taken only a three node four node system a gets notified you know c gets notified and d gets notified but now only a and c are having the copy of the ledger so now what they would do they would uh, each of these nodes when they when they got registered you know through an approved uh, process each one of them have been given a private key and a public key so now though in the absence of that private key it might take tr trillion years for you to um, you know unlock or you know open that block but because you have got a private key now a race would start between c and a each of them have got private keys and then they will start racing among themselves and then they keep running the algorithms jillions of number of times against the block to be able to unlock it so the one who has got more computing power right and a better algorithm would be able to unlock this block and the moment they unlock the block then who is then they use that block use that hash and then they go back and scan the the old uh, blocks in the blockchain and identify the previous block and once they identify the previous block they link them as you can see on the top of uh, the slide you can see this hash will become the uh, the previous block uh, previous uh, block hash of the other block right so the, and so on and so forth this is how the linking would happen so what's happening here as soon as the transaction is broadcasted to all nodes then everyone had a race condition to find the appropriate hash key whoever finds the hash key then they go and they open and understand the transaction details they go back to the previous block they use that hash and then they search the blocks and then they identify the block with the previous hash because they have got a copy of them so it's so easy for them to go back and get the previous block and then they combine you know they extend the chain by combining both of them and once they do it and then they publish it to all nodes and who you know um, uh, cryptocurrency there i hope it is uh, this year to everyone and this is how it looks like like you know if you think of a bank bank as a node or a miner then you can think that each one of us if bank has got 300 uh, you know customers it will have 300 chains um, initializing uh, from starting position so those 300 chains would keep increasing uh, based on the number of transactions that are happening uh, with respect to that particular uh, uh, account so this is how in a nutshell how blockchain technology would work so someone would request a transaction and the requested transaction is broadcasted to the p2p network consisting of all the computers known as nodes which is what i explained and then the verified transaction can involve cryptocurrency you know there will be a rewarding mechanism right now it is bitcoin and then whoever gets it they gets a bitcoin and then uh, because there should be a rewarding mechanism why should someone invest a lot of money time resources to be able to compute and then validate uh, the universal ledger right so once they do it once they verify the transaction then they link it with the old block and then they would consolidate the chain and then the transaction is uh, called uh, marked as uh, uh, complete so that's in a nutshell how you know the blockchain would work and my favorite my favorite uh, uh, you know example this is you know from one of the popular ted talks I, i came across this and you know the gentleman he actually explains blockchain in a very very friendlier way says that it's like a kitty party and you might have heard about kitty party right you know it's a regular social gathering of a group of women meeting and having some so social you know some good food playing cards some intellectual conversations and finally each member contributes some money to a central pool and lots are drawn to decide which member will get the entire sum so it's the mini the money part which is important here let's say there are 15 women and everyone puts 1000 rupees 15000 there's a lucky draw winner gets 15000 rupees as the group pulls the money the lucky draw is happening the very interesting point here is there is no single trusted authority if you are one of the women whom are you trusting there is no one super woman in the group right there is no bank you are actually trusting all the other women and you also know that if someone wanted to defraud you everyone needs to be compromised unless you know they are able to influence everyone else you know you will never uh, there is no scope of fraud there so we already learned that blockchain is all about changing the concept of trust from centralized to distributed right so it's the distributed trust which actually the you know as i mentioned heart and soul of the blockchain think of all these women as nodes miners think of all that money as the cryptocurrency 
and there is a distributed trust among all of them so the distributed trust security consensus provenance provenance is basically the ability to be able to trace an event back so these are the four salient features of uh, you know blockchain but the interesting thing is um, but nowadays all governments are blocking uh, uh, bitcoin so they say as you can see on the slide government does not consider cryptocurrency as a legal tender or a coin and will take all measures to eliminate the use of crypto assets however government will explore blockchain to add muscle to the you know digital uh, uh, economy so what happened was over the years bitcoin was used uh, for a lot of illegal things such as gambling illegal trafficking sex trafficking drugs what not on the dark net so that's when policy makers uh, you know started thinking def differently and instead of uh, instead of regulating the crypto cryptocurrency they simply banned them and uh, it's not just in india it's you know it's a common notion which is prevailing across many countries around the globe and um, the governments think that blockchain is good but bitcoin is the evil so blockchain is you know can be used for many purposes but cryptocurrency is uh, you know bad so that's how uh, that's how they you know uh, do it and uh, there are lots of uh, you know there are lots of uh, um, uh, use cases of uh, uh, blockchain as well so i will just uh, mention one use case and then uh, uh, move forward let's say that you know i'm someone you know who loves mangoes but i have got an allergic reaction to the chemicals that are used to ripen the mangoes and i go to a supermarket and i look for mangoes um, but there will be organic label on you know all the mangoes and i I'll, i'll go and i wanted to buy only those mangoes which have got the organic label and you don't know whether that uh, company has printed a label by downloading something from the internet or you know is it a genuine one because it's all about trust right and uh, i know that for a fact there are lots of different agencies in india which are certified to you know print that uh, label on the mangoes but i have no idea whether the mangoes are organic or not just imagine the day a mango company comes out and says that it is running its business on blockchain technology and it will put a qr code on the mangoes now i can go i can scan that qr code with my phone it opens up an app and it shows all the transactions that happened in the you know right from the mango farm including all the chemicals that were applied grading packaging transportation distribution you know all the way to you know when it was shipped to the store that you are currently standing in and which mango do you buy you know we would ob obviously if you are someone like me having allergic allergic uh, reaction to chemicals then you would obviously buy uh, the mango mango from a mango company which is using the uh, you know blockchain uh, uh, technology and there are lots of uh, you know other use cases as well i don't want to go into them because we will focus on we'll focus on energy there are lots of other use cases you know there are some companies in india who are trying to create um, a, 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 a platform like you know uber for tractors like there's no middleman like uh, you know you can pull all the tractors and then they can register themselves into your blockchain technology application and then uh, they can manage all the all the complexities uh, that would arise uh, um, um, out of you know such a business and then or else maybe 10 different people can uh, have a fractional ownership of a tractor and then they can start using it there are lots of other use cases and uh, for your uh, benefit um for your information ap government already started using blockchain for land record management so actually what happens is when you may say that uh, all governments are already digitized the land records uh, but the problem is even if the land records are digitized someone can still go and tamper them right someone can still go and change the records and they can transfer the ownership you will know who it belongs who who, who it belongs to but not who it belonged to again blockchain can be used to solve these uh, problems so what ap government is doing is um, and how they are using this blockchain is uh, they are first digitizing it and putting everything into a blockchain format and and later what happens is right now everyone can uh, right from a data entry operator you know to an office that everyone can go and change the land records which, which ultimately you know lead to disputes but now what they are trying to do is after implementing this blockchain technology they will give separate login logins and you know um, when an official makes an attempt to tamper the record the owner of the respect to land will get a text message along with few other departments let's say that uh, the uh, government is creating a blockchain land land management uh, uh, system with the blockchain where different nodes are going to be maybe forest department agriculture department right you know the revenue department they all maintain they all will become nodes and they all will maintain the start utilizing the single ledger which is available and if some operator goes and if you know if he tries to tamper it tries to do it immediately 
uh, all the stakeholders in the system right from the owner of the order of the uh, you know rica land they'll get notifications when they get notifications we can go and you know we can complain and uh, you know and how can you achieve that i mentioned about smart contract in the beginning blockchain has got a co concept called smart contract and if you can put some logic into it in such a way that when so and so thing happens when a change happens on this transaction please go ahead and notify uh, app send an app notification send an email notification so you can do all of that so those are some of the use cases so, so what i can do i can turn off all the appliances or majority of the appliances in my house and i can start i can start you know exporting more energy but the problem is we are doing it today in our technology supports that we we know we ask we notify them they export it but they have to wait until the end of the month to get to know in some countries you know it's a three months billing cycle so you have to wait until the end of three months or until the end of one month to be able to know how much power i have exported but using blockchain and using single ledger if everyone is using the single ledger then if we give to app if you give an access to a customer real time we get to see the money flowing into his account as the as the solar energy is getting exported i hope you are with me and you know i'm sounding it interesting a few more slides um so this is the micro uh, uh, micro grid concept so what happened is uh, there are a lot of countries lot of cities they already started using micro grids now imagine if there is a power failure to the main line which is bringing electricity into hyderabad then what happens entire city would go dark right but now if you use the concept of micro grid and if you enable p2p energy trading then what would happen is so in this concept the beauty here is you are still connected with the grid you are still connected with the main grid but you are you have uh, you have come up with a system where you would enable people you know to sell uh, if someone has got more electricity they will be able to sell the electricity uh, into the people in that region itself so it would the grid would take electricity from the main one only when uh, there is uh, you know more demand uh, that more more demand than the supply within the micro grid so actually historically if you look at india we also always have this centralized uh, power is a centralized concept you have one or you know few power plants and power is distributed from those power plants you know works in cities very well right you know even if you look at remote villages it doesn't make economic sense uh, if you have to you know lay the transmission lines distribution lines all the way to a remote uh, you know place so you have to produce power where you need power in the economic sense so you can use solar wind and other things uh, but the problem is how do you make it economically viable so if some house is producing more power they don't need it and that power uh, you know and and then they they can sell that power to um, you know people living in that community so using iot and little bit of blockchain uh, you can link all the houses with solar panels and then automatically excess power can be transferred to the deficit power and money from the house with excess power automatically gets transferred to the house with the deficit uh, power so you can just uh, i'm not sure whether you would let me know if you are able to um, hear the sound can you hear the sound can you hear the sound can yes, someone sir. unmute and tell me uh, yes okay yes sir i can hear your voice please continue Yeah, sir. Uh, this video sound we could not hear, sir. Actually, hello. Can you maybe hear? producers? Yes, yes. No. no. Yes. More than Bitcoin, blockchain looks to be the technology that will deliver the smart electric grid. The grid is. changing in the US and globally renewable energy wind solar and even batteries is now cheaper to develop and operate and is penetrating the market to small business and even homeowners who now may be producers as well as customers a smart grid is developing where small buyers and sellers of electricity How will this disparate group of generators, buyers and sellers be able to maneuver along the new transmission path? Blockchain. Blockchain is basically a decentralized accounting ledger with the potential to enable, manage, track and verify thousands of energy transactions per second. Many of those will be small, well below the capacity of existing systems to handle efficiency. 
Blockchain also is eyed as the system to handle charging stations for electric vehicles and provide proof of authority for customers wanting to use renewable energy. Sluggishness may still be a problem with blockchain. Bitcoin system handles 4.6 transactions per second. For comparison, systems used by credit card companies that are not blockchain handle thousands per second. Blockchain needs to up its game, and there are hundreds of players trying to do just that. According to Ernst & Young, over $1 billion of venture capital has been tapped by a growing group of startups to build the market. The London Energy Web Foundation believes the energy market requires a blockchain tailored to the sector, and there now are multiple efforts to boost capacity. Some are starting to show results. The Energy Web Foundation has been shepherding an open source version for its affiliates to experiment with and develop. Based on proof of authority, it this system uses less energy to record provenance and track ownership of renewable energy production, including details of source and type, location, time, and emissions. And just as important, it's fast. Pilot projects around the globe are showing promise. In Norway, the utility Vattenfall is experimenting with a private blockchain to record energy transactions in which commercial or residential customers can sell power from their solar panels or batteries. In the US, the Brooklyn Microgrid project is in its third year of operation as the first successful peer-to-peer -peer blockchain system, operating through smart meters. In Brooklyn, about 500 people are buying and selling locally generated power through a mobile app that sets a predetermined bid price for purchasing power for those who want it with those who sell it. Such efforts offer real-time guarantees to customers that the power they use really comes from renewable sources. Existing systems now take weeks of information because they are centrally managed through a third party. Blockchain promises to eliminate that third party and greatly speed the transaction, allowing the customer to track the energy it purchases and ensure it meets sustainable goals. Okay, so in the interest of... Uh, so, sorry. So in the interest of time, I will uh, um, I will conclude my presentation by saying that there are a couple of use cases I don't think I'll be able to do justice. So I'll I'll conclude. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. So I'll conclude by saying that um, blockchain is similar but different from internet. As I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, that uh, blockchain has got the potential to change the future. Uh, you know, in the next 20 years. And if you look at internet, internet solved many problems for us. You know, it solved the information problem with search. It solved the distribution problem with, you know, likes of Amazon, YouTube for videos and music and digital files. It solved communication problem with the email. However, however, the internet could not solve two problems. It could not solve disintermediation and trust. Actually, instead of solving the issue, it has created far more powerful intermediate in, intermediaries before the commencement of the internet. Like now there's a Google for information, Facebook in communication, Amazon for distribution, Uber in logistics, Microsoft for, you know, the desktops and, you know, some standard software. You know, these are some of the powerful intermediaries. Look at transportation. Transport, transportation should be a peer-to-peer, -peer, but now it is passenger Instead of passenger to the driver, it is now driver, passenger to Uber, Uber to driver. It means it created a lot of intermediaries in the system. You know what the blockchain can do? Blockchain can remove all these intermediaries because it's a single ledger and we are incentivizing people who can validate and we can confirm the accuracy of the, you know, the uh, blocks and no one can tamper the blocks. It's secure, safe. But now because Bitcoin is not popular, governments wanted to use the technology, right? And then they, they wanted to put a process around it, identify the nodes and maintain it, on, maintain it on their own. And you know, if you're 
ever been hit by a polite email from nigeria you know that internet is uh, you know far from solving the trust problem therefore we have to look up to blockchain to solve the trust problem so that's why you would be surprised to know that many banks stock exchanges logistic firms remittance firms the, the likes of visas mastercards of the world they are rushing to understand and perhaps embrace blockchain before it you know swallows them so i am expecting um, in the years to come you would uh, you know i don't know how much you know how much you picked up from this presentation or how much you picked up from listening to a lot of you know people who spoke to you last one week or so how much of blockchain you understood but i can definitely tell you that this is going to bring back the harness to goodness and peer to peer economy in the years to come it's you know because of various factors it is not as you have seen in the video it has to resolve that scale problem as well and that's why it is you know going at a slow pace slower pace but in the days to come you would definitely see you know lots of things because trust is the key right and you know it is resolving that trust problem so you know there is no doubt for me to say that we are going to move to that trust economy with the help of blockchain in the years to come thank you for the opportunity and i rushed a little bit i know uh, because i did not uh, confine to the timelines um, but i am happy to take the questions if there are any